I'm Doug Fern, and this is my take on music recording. I'm here today at Sweetwater Studios with Sean Dealey, chief engineer of the studios, and we have a lot to talk about, but I really want to focus on Atmos today. So, Sean, thanks. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, super happy, happy to have you here. Uh, it's just uh, nice to have you back in the studio, so happy to talk to you about uh, some of my favorite things. Yeah. Well, we're in uh, Sweetwater Studio B, which is the Atmos mix room, which I've been in here several times and heard just amazing things that you've done in here. It's just really been impressive to me. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, a big fan of, of your work and, and your your gear. And um, having someone like you coming in here and listen has been an absolute pleasure. So I'm, I'm happy that uh, that you also enjoy listening. It's, it's one of my favorite places to be. So uh, I spend a lot of time in this space. And, you know, it's uh, probably my favorite place to listen to music. So, yeah, I can understand that. Before we get started, I know you've had a long career. Um, before we, before uh, Sweetwater. So you want to just give us a rundown of some of the high points of that? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I'm originally from Canada, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, I grew up somewhat around the industry. My dad owns a road case company. So kind of, you know, going to shows, being backstage, seeing things like that. Started playing uh, drums when I was about 12, playing some, you know, some punk rock bands and, and some stuff like that. But uh Mid-teenage years, got into recording through a, a high school recording class, and then turned 18, went on the road, started teching with people, so guitar, bass, drum, tech, and that started feeding my uh, studio acquisition department, uh, started buying gear, started recording stuff, so I was working with a lot of a lot of, you know, fairly substantial artists when I was pretty young, you know, toured with Avril Lavigne, went to 49 countries with her in uh, early 2000s, uh, worked with the Goo Goo Dolls, uh, did a little bit with Santana, and uh, landed with the Counting Crows, and so spent a bunch of years with them, started as their drum and keyboard tech, uh, and uh, from there went to uh, producing a record and engineering a record with them and then mixing front of house and then spent close to 10 years working with them. And so while I was not on the road with them, I was running independent recording studios up in Winnipeg, uh, making records with independent artists. Um, a couple notable things with the Weaker Thans, which is a independent artist from Winnipeg and Ken Mode, Propagandy, some of, um, some of my favorite bands growing up. It was kind of cool to finally get to work with them and stuff like that. So uh did that up until the time I decided to transition from touring and studio owning to uh being a full-time employee here at Sweetwater. And it had a you know a fairly varied uh adventure here so far as well when I first got to Sweetwater I ended up working as a production manager at the Clyde Theater uh for Chuck Serac and they had opened a venue in town. So I did that for a couple of years. 2020, I got invited to come back to the studio and take a more active role here, and uh, we know what happened in early 2020 with live music, and uh, so I uh, kind of planted my feet fairly firmly here, and we've been doing a lot of really cool stuff for the past few years in the studio. So, um, yeah, bounced around a lot, but uh, very happy to be here in Fort Wayne right now. So, Yeah, well, this is an amazing place. I mean, it's like the, the ultimate candy store for recording. <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, spoiled would be an understatement of, uh, you know, our options here at Sweetwater. But, you know, we were out for dinner last night. We were talking with a friend of mine who's here working with us on some some projects. And, you know, someone who's been around the industry for a long period of time, you know, going to a studio, even the most equipped studios have some limitations. Uh, we uh, have... I feel like not very many limitations as far as it goes from, you know, I would like X, Y, Z instrument to, you know, what kind of technical stuff or even, you know, things that people haven't seen yet. We see a lot of pre-release stuff. And so, uh, I feel very grateful to be in an opportunity to work here every day and, and have that, uh, at my disposal. So, yeah, yeah, it's a great, great opportunity. Just a wonderful facility. You know, you've really developed your Atmos chops over over the last few years. How did you get started with that? I guess summer of 2021, I was made aware of 
Atmos and some conversations. We kind of heard some rumors about it coming to music effectively. And so uh, had done a little bit of research. We talked about the importance of being involved in that and finding a way to equip our studios to be part of that movement towards, I think, engaging in spatial audio and immersive audio in music. And so uh, a few preliminary conversations happened in the fall of 2021 about us trying to figure out how to get our studios going in that direction. And so to be honest, uh, it was fairly elusive at the beginning. And I still think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to still be learned about Atmos, but we did the best we could about finding out who some of the bigger players in the Atmos realm were. Uh, we ended up partnering with our friends at PMC to work on this studio and, that was, you know, through the tail end of 2021 about figuring out how we would equip our space to be able to start mixing and working in Atmos. And so that took a while. That was sort of the tail end of the, you know, supply chain shortages and things like that. So it took a little bit longer than we had hoped to kind of get the, the room running. But through, you know, a lot of research and connections in the industry, uh, myself and Jason Peets here, who uh, who works with me here, uh, we put this room together, mapped it out, got the speakers, did the install, wired it up, and kind of got it ready to function as an Atmos space. Now, kind of, you know, getting that going and, and not fully understanding all of it was kind of a really great thing, I think, for the learning process of, like, sort of uncovering what Atmos is, what it does, what it can and can't do. And we got this room together and functioning, which is a feat in itself, and then sat down with a piece of music and tried to get it to be cool in Atmos and be excited. And yeah, I mean, closing your eyes and driving a car, I would compare it to, or, uh, you know, not knowing where you're walking and, and just, you know, we kind of stumbled into it and, uh, honestly was fairly unimpressed with, uh, what we were able to do at the beginning. And I think it was a slow slow burn on us to figure out how to do it effectively. Um, but immediately as we came online with our studio here, we had already been engaged with, uh, yourself and George and Joff Hazelrig about some of the people doing the best work at the time in the Atmos industry. So we spent the first few months of 2022 getting this room sounding right, calibration, tuning, experimentation, moving some stuff around, kind of figuring out, like getting our feet wet and in our sea legs uh, with Atmos. And uh, we had a, a visitor that you guys brought to us, Mike Miller, came by, um, I want to say April 2022, something like that. And uh, Mike had just finished the Harry Styles record. And at that point in time was by far the most impressive thing I had heard in the Atmos music field. And so sitting down and listening to that and experiencing the music in Atmos in a way that I had never even conceived was possible before, that's what pretty much locked in my focus of like, I need to figure out how to do this. I need to do this and keep doing it. And this is the most exciting and emotionally engaging way that I've ever heard music in a studio, bar none. It just blew me away when I heard something that finally clicked and pushed it past the kind of surround soundy sort of like stereo with some stuff. It became this immersive experience in the seat where my body could feel the music, my body could feel the emotion, the impact of what was going on changed my perception of the music. And so that really, uh, got me extremely excited in focusing a lot of energy into figuring out how to make this work. And so, uh, Mike was instrumental. You guys were instrumental in that. And, and in that process we did, I can't remember exactly the timeline of what we did, but I know Mike was here and I can't remember if we did some recording the first time or if we came back and did some recording, but right after Mike was here, I ended up mixing my first record in, 
uh, Dolby Atmos, which is the Animals as Leaders record that I did, which um, still extremely proud of. Uh, it was an amazing uh, record to be part of as far as a really progressive band with really kind of forward thinking music that I could adapt to this forward thinking platform and make use of the space and the movement. And, you know, really kind of had an opportunity to spread my Atmos wings and have an artist that was in, engaged with that. Javier from the band came here and, and worked with us on the mix. And so that was like my first go at, like I felt I was prepped after Mike had been here. I sort of unlocked some of the secrets of Atmos. I feel to like, you know, working with the space and the finding the right spots for things. Uh, kind of got my feet wet with that, got into that, that record, it took nine months to come out. So I was sitting on this record kind of like, man, this is gonna be great when people can hear this, but we ended up doing a lot of experimentation with Mike, uh, and his assistant Tyler on a project that's still, uh, I think in limbo, but we, you know, that's where we started doing some of the recording, uh, conceptually recording music for Atmos, which I still think is uncharted territory. Um, and I keep going back and forth on whether or not it is the validity of it in the current production climate makes a lot of sense, but we keep experimenting, trying to find a path to make the Atmos be the star of the show and the stereo, maybe not the focal point, but stereo still has such a huge, impact in just you know the way people create think uh mix master approve that whole process is so uh entrained ingrained in people's you know musical journey that like the whole process of approving an atmos mix is still a little bit uh, of a gray area so stereo is where we kind of commit to all the things that we're doing and then when we get to atmos there's a little bit more creativity but the thing that you know i've been really hyper aware of is really maintaining all of the aspects and balances of the stereo mix and all of my atmos work and that's sort of been still a tricky thing you know when you know something is sitting right in a stereo mix that's a hard judgment to make in Atmos because of the space and because of the lack of compression on compression on compression or limiting and things like that, that we've become so trained to do in stereo. I've made a few attempts at Atmos mixes that yield stereo and, uh, I still not sold on that process, but, uh, I don't think it's too far away from being a reality. So you think that there's still a place for doing the stereo mix separately yeah, and and that's the majority of my my work these days has been stem based Atmos spatialization of stereo, and you know I I hate to take away any credit from a stereo mix engineer who's taken the artistic approach of you know balances, effects, tonalities, and really created something that's super cohesive in the stereo realm. I take that hopefully as finished as possible and spatialize it for them in a way that maintains all of that integrity, but gives the listener a more engaging, uh, uh, listening experience using the tech that we have, you know, being able to listen on AirPods or your phone or in a car or a soundbar and get that sort of pop and, or immersive feeling that Atmos gives you without, you know, uh, changing, too much of the work they put into the stereo. And so that's something I've been really hyper-focused on is just taking it and making it work in this this format and, you know, delivering something that respects the work that happens in stereo but hopefully impresses people with this Atmos, you know. And that's something, too, that gets talked about a bunch is, like, making something sound good in the room. The headphones are... I think an equally as important component. So, you know, there's a, there's a process and technique that we've adapted recently that I think puts equal amounts of importance on what it sounds like in the room, what it sounds like in binaural and how the Apple spatial translates. And that's something we've been working with uh, a mastering engineer, Brian Lucy out of uh, Los Angeles, originally from Columbus. And, and Brian and I have worked together for years and uh he a very opinionated guy uh usually based in in you know experimenting and finding a process and so we had him in here last fall and sort of 
He's developed this Cardinal Points Quad, uh, as he calls it, and um, that's something that we've been adapting most of our workflow to, and it's pushing things that have low-frequency information into all corners of the room, solidifies the way you hear the Atmos mix in the space, and then translates to the headphones in a more exciting way that can yield better results than stereo in headphones if treated properly. And uh, Apple Spatial uh, behaves extremely well and have great translation across all of the platforms. And so that's been a really interesting, you know, development. But we've found that somewhere between every three and four months, we're doing something completely new and figuring out what the next step is and how that yields the best results. And being open to that, I think, is is integral to having some success and mixing in Atmos, but then also allowing the technology to develop. You know, we don't want to be holding something back because we believe it should only be one way. It's, you know, I want to be doing things that give the listener the best possible experience that the art, you know, the artist can put something out and it can be an amazing experience for uh, whoever's, you know, the, the end listener. So, well, you, I go back to the days of quad, you know, which was interesting. I found that with tracking, the big advantage was you could put the stuff that you needed to hear but weren't important in back of you and focus on what you were recording. Yeah. But, you know, as a format, it never gained any traction. So that sort of put me in a predisposed to dislike at most. Yeah. <laughs> And that was sort of reinforced by some of the early demos that I heard, you know, where they put every instrument discreetly in a different spot in the room. And it was like the balance was like, well, what is this? It depends on where you are in the room. So I was skeptical. And it really was listening to some stuff in here that, that Mike Miller had done and that you had done that I started to understand it. And to realize that even, you know, you, you did the Atmos mix on that Hazel Rig Trio album, which I wasn't really involved in the recording. I did the stereo mix on that. Yeah. But we, uh, I mean, I've heard it so many times. So I, I know exactly everything that's going on yeah. in there. But I found out I didn't know everything that was going on in there. And sitting here, I think I was sitting in this seat and you played that back, and I'm listening, and I'm hearing stuff that I didn't even know was in the recording, that I'd never heard, and I had access to the, to the individual tracks, which was you know, a very minimalist recording technique for yeah. that, which I'm sure was a challenge for you. But somehow, and I don't know how to describe it, and I don't know if there is really an explanation, but suddenly the whole mix made sense. I could hear everything that was going on, all the subtleties that that I never knew were there. It was amazing. Yeah, it. Th there's something that, it, it, there's an unmasking that I feel happens. I mean, for years we've been trying to cram so much into two channels and expect to hear back all of the things we've done. And that, that dance of like those balances and, and, you know, making things come and, you know, sit properly the expansion into the space I feel allows for unmasking of the subtleties and things. So something can kind of stand on its own and you can hear the detail or the clarity in what's going on. And, you know, th there's, there's a fine line between that too, because I think, you know, mentioning like, okay, there's a piece over here. There's a piece over there. Like when you have things that have very localized sounding placement, to me, that feels disconnected. What I want to feel is, you know, a cohesiveness of the music in the space. And that's something that, you know, especially with their technique of, I mean, it was four channels, right? So four microphone diaphragms, technically only three microphones, but placing that in a way that I felt inside of it, and there was nothing that was too disconnected. I didn't want the piano to sound like it was over there or whatever, but making a, somewhat of a creative and technical choice to make it feel like it was together, but as big as possible, you know, spaciously yeah. finding that, that balance I think is 
it doesn't work all the time, but in, in that case, it was, a, it was an amazing thing to just kind of find the, the right spot for that to sit. And then when you kind of sat back and listened to it, and even on the headphones, like, it's spectacular, the, the binaural component of that. And um, it sort of it impressed me listening to it, not having conceptually know, known what I've done, but then also being very impressed that the outcome is super awesome. I mean, like a happy accident of like figuring out that stuff is if it's more enjoyable to listen to and it's more of like a... That was kind of a feel thing, trying to figure out how to make that balance. It wasn't super technical of like, this is here and this is here. It's like I kind of felt around in our space and ended up with something that yielded a really cohesive yet detailed immersive mix. And so, yeah, we should talk about the way that was recorded because the Hazel Riggs has developed this recording technique. I had some influence on that, but they basically figured out how to do their trio that way using two AEA R88 mics. It could be done with one, but they did it with two because they like recording the piano with the lid off with the R88 over top of the the bridge of the piano. We did a video on our technique of recording piano. To me, that's, that's the best piano sound I've ever gotten. And then they use another R88 in between the drums and the upright bass. And they just position that to, to balance the two. And they record in a studio that's like a third of the side of this, this room. I mean, the grand piano, the Steinway, takes up most of the space. Yeah. Because the piano projects upward and the other ones are horizontal, you need two mics. You know, they're both bloom lines. And I've been a big fan of bloom lines since the 70s, early 70s, when I first discovered that technique. And I just said, this is the most amazing spatial feel that I've ever gotten out of stereo. Yeah. It's basically the only, the only technique I use in stereo. Just by chance, I think, and you can tell me your feeling on this, that there's something about that bloom line pickup where you have a bi-directional stereo pickup with two sides in phase and two sides out of phase. And there's always some out of phase content in that room. It's bleed, it's room sound and all that. That seems to work really well in Atmos. And somehow that just, it likes, Atmos likes that. Yeah. I, and, and I think, yeah, to, 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 yeah, to go on the bloom line technique to me, I feel represents the way humans hear more effectively than any other stereo miking technique. And uh, the the AA R eighty eight is a microphone I've owned one for probably twelve fourteen years. Uh, never recorded a drum kit without one since I've got it. And uh, that being said, I just finished recording a drum kit. I think there's 24 mics on the kit. So like a different approach, but you know, if I was to ever be, you know, challenged to use a microphone on drums and bass, that that would be the first one that I would go to. But the reason that I use it, I put it in front of the drum kit always about somewhere between three to six feet is I can stand there and listen to the drums. When I pull that microphone up, it sounds like a drum kit. And it also captures the space that it's in like i'm standing there and i have the front image of the drum kit and then the spatial depth of the room that i'm in and that's something that i think you know if we have a forward-facing stereo pair or something that rejects any of the space around it it kind of you know neuters the ability to get the depth that atmos can give to things and so that's something that really is an interesting approach when we're working in spatial is like those microphones that have more depth of field in the recording, I think will give us more, give us the ability to play something, but then still have it feel like it's deeper in in the the Atmos space, which that tying into some of the stuff that we did with the Hazel Rigs and, and with, with Tyler on his project was I'm still trying to find the best way to get Atmos 
recorded and reproduced so like techniques about miking and so we had done a bunch of stuff in our studio here with with george and joff and they were playing and we had done bloom line with a pair of aa 44s but my approach for capturing the space was to use omnidirectional microphones at the boundary of the recording space because that's to me like this captures the instrument and the space around where we're picking it up, but then also capturing the entire space, I think is an interesting, uh, approach and technique, which I have yet to find how to make it work in a mix in stereo and in Atmos. So I'm still kind of whittling away at making it function. But, um, when we were set up to record that, this is a wild experience sitting in this room, we were monitoring what was going on in real time. I was sitting in here kind of making some engineering choices of placement. And we had six mic microphones, uh, DPA 4011s in that space. And they were in two corners and the sides and then in the far corners. And I had reproduced them in this space. And so I was sitting where you're sitting. Mm -hmm. And I heard a guy come in the door over here that doesn't exist. And I could feel him walk through the room yeah. sonically, which that kind of broke my brain as far as like the potential for what this can do and how we can really reproduce spaces in Atmos. But bespoke Atmos mixes to me haven't yet found their place when we're still working in stereo. So it's sort of a trade off, but that's still a thing we're working, you know, working with, I'm still trying different mics. I have some Sheps right now that I'm trying that, uh, I feel have a really natural approach. I've tried some audio technicas, some telefunkins. And so trying to find the thing that gives me the most natural decay of a space, uh, to reproduce in Atmos, but that's yeah, work in progress. I still not totally, sold on on my my findings but uh you know still trying to figure out a way to make it work and i think that that's that's a cool thing to be able to reproduce physical spaces inside of a studio effectively and make that translate so yeah well i was here for some of that recording and one of the things we did is we used your racquetball court sure did <laughs> it was pretty wild yeah um, it's uh it you know it's a racquetball court but man the proportions of that room are just right. It's really got a very smooth decay. It's a beautiful sounding space. Yeah, it would, and that that was a really cool experience trying to figure out how that worked and how the room worked, right? Like we could feed it. We put in a pretty substantial speaker as a Focal Trio 11 with an 18-inch sub mm -hmm. sitting about a third of the way into the room to sort of excite the space. And then we used the six mics to pick up the ambience and depending on how much level we drove the room with we could excite it and have it you know go on forever or if we had like a you know like a lower level thing we could just kind of get some some sparkle from the space but um it's a pretty amazing you know experiment as far as like you know the classic reverb chambers and the classic studios like we're used to that sort of natural decay of a room but then capturing it in a spatial capacity I feel like has a lot of potential even translating that into like hopefully future tech of like IR based reverbs and stuff, having more dimensions of rooms that we can use in this, you know, in the future. So, uh, but yeah, we haven't been up to the racquetball court lately, but it's still, you know, we're kind of gearing up when we find the right thing to go up there and put back into the court. We'll, we'll go up there and, and take the mics and the, the speaker and stuff. But, um, yeah. And that, that is a, a some of the things that we put in there, we took some synthesizers from the Sweetwater Museum, which there's some keyboards, there's a mono poly and a couple cool uh, synthesizers that, you know, a DI'd synthesizer sounds, you know, a certain way. But yeah. that ethereal space with that was still one of the most spectacular sounding things I've ever heard. Yeah. So I hope we can figure out a way to get more people to hear that and work that into some projects. And uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, of course, the problem with a racquetball court is you have to wait until everybody's out of the building. Yeah, it gets quite loud in there. They didn't yeah. like it when you're you know, kick drums and guitars. and Yeah, so, it, but it was fun. And that's, you know, uh, another, you know, a wild thing. Like, I, I didn't really expect to be in a cornfield in the middle of Indiana doing this stuff every day of the week, but quite love it, you know. And, and a racquetball court isn't, you know, normally something you can get into and experiment like that, so... 
Right. It's been fun. Yeah. Just run down what this room has. You know, what what is the designation? So, yeah, this is a 914 uh, configuration, Dolby Atmos, uh, with PMC speakers. So we have uh, 8.2 XBD is our left, right, uh, and 8.2 is the center. Four sub 228s, if I'm not mistaken. And then we have uh, 10 CI65 as surround speakers. Um, the... System is running off of a Mac Studio with an Avid Matrix. I'm using radar, uh, IZ technology radar mm-hmm. converters to drive yeah. uh, the outputs of my system, which are amazing sounding converters. So I've you know been in the weeds on conversion for many years, and they, they sent me some to try. And so we've been using them for a while. That's actually made a pretty substantial improvement to the sonic integrity of the space. Outside of that, we have the ability to stream 914 uh, from an Apple TV through a JBL synthesis receiver. Uh, I mix stereo here. There's a bunch of outboard gear here and DW Fern stuff here. So I have a stereo mix rig, summing rig with, um, you know, we have a VT5, a VT7, uh, Rupert Neve Master Bus Processor, 5057, uh, Mog, uh, Magnum K compressors, Better Maker Mastering Limiter, some Burl, some Crane Song. So lots of fun toys. I, I spend, I don't know, probably I'm 60, 40 Atmos to stereo now, doing a lot of Atmos, but still do a lot of stereo. So I, I do both in this room here. We can record. Uh, <laughs> I don't really track much in here. We have another studio here that's quite spectacular where we, we sort of do most of our tracking. And so, yeah, it's been it's been a fun room. I mean, this, this to me, world-class space, uh, but I also feel like this is my... I'm at a point now I've spent so much time in this room and I trust this room when I leave here and I can go listen. I I just listened to a bunch of my mixes on a Genelec system. That's a temporary setup here. And the translation is spectacular, which I'm very happy about, but I've been down to Nashville a couple of times in some different spaces. And when I pull up my mixes and listen, I get what I want out of them. And I can actually hear what's going on in the spaces because I'm so familiar with the space that I'm in. And that's always, I think the goal of someone who works in the studio all the time is to be able to have that comfort in knowing the work they do here sounds right. And when you leave, you can hear the deficiencies in other systems, which, you know, that's, uh, uh, I guess a good thing, but I always kind of, I'm like, I better go listen to that in my space and see how it sounds. Yeah. So it really sounds right? Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that's a, uh, that's a great thing to be able to come to every day. And, you know, when I pull up a mix or start something, it's just, it's nice to have trust in, in my baseline here and, and know what's going on. So, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are tracking stuff that they know ultimately is going to end up as Atmos. Uh, There's going to be an Atmos mix of it. So at this point, and I know this is a a moving target because we're all learning how to do this, but do you have any general rules for people that would give you stems that would be make your job easier and give them a better product? Yeah, I don't know. It's been such a struggle. It's it's I'm working with one label that really has a pretty tight system in place, which has been great and it's been an easy process, but the stem creation process and getting the right stems, effective stems, stems without mistakes or or issues has been kind of one of the hardest things. And so uh, I haven't touched a lot of back catalogs, so I'm doing mostly current production records. So people are in the mixing process. I can get them to create stems. I can usually get them to go back and adjust some stuff. But that process in itself is usually so tedious and time-consuming that I get one shot at kind of having... Uh, the mix engineer, or if the artist is mixing it themselves, to get me the stems, and so I kind of give them. I have a document I send out, but like, a, like, like ground rules to like get me something that'll function. And and I've had to kind of adapt on some cases. I don't feel like we're at a point yet where I could ask for extra stuff from artists and have that be useful. Like, uh, I was listening to a podcast of yours with Justin Gray, who we finally got to meet at Nam this year talking about alternate takes and decorrelated material from a recording process and you know someone that would spend the time to comp another take of vocals or retract something to have an extra 
piece that didn't make it in the stereo mix, I think is, is too much to ask of people at the moment. I don't know. I, I hope that at some point we can end up with, you know, a preparation for stereo and then have extra bits for Atmos that work really well. And, and I think right now we're at a point where, you know, I have to have a conversation with either the label or the artist explaining to them what Atmos is, how it gets delivered, what they should expect in the process. And, you know, there's a lot of education going on right now. I haven't seen too many people that are fully equipped and ready to go to the next step creatively in the realm of Atmos um, yet. And I hope to see it. Um, but, you know, a as far as, you know, even our experiments, I've done a few things that I did, you know, I was like, oh, I got the Atmos mics, I'll use those. And when it came time to kind of integrate it into the mix, it just, it didn't find its place. And so um, I think it's still a work in progress. I'm excited to see people that maybe get a little more creative and, specializing like compositions or like you know when we get into doing some parts and maybe this is going to be a thing where you know in a studio we can be recording the parts that go over there and the parts that go over there but you know where we are right now is i'm just hoping i get enough mm -hmm. to get the bare minimum to make something cool with I, I hope that we will end up getting more than we need to get even more creative but right now it's it's been tricky and then the back catalog stuff we're we're sitting on a couple of cool things that, you know, the approval process when there's multiple people, labels and artists to get that across the finish line has been tricky. And that in itself, doing a remix in stereo and then spatializing that is uh, its own can of worms. Yeah. So yeah. I don't, I don't envy you. <laughs> no. And, and, and thankfully we haven't done a lot of it. Um, we may, we maybe we'll get into it, but I, I feel like, you know, how many times can you repaint the picture, right? Like how many times do we need another version of a Beatles record? Like it's cool. And we know those records and there's some great stuff that's been done, but respect some of the historical parts of music. Some of the things I've heard in Atmos that are back catalog, don't do the stereo mixes justice. And so you really need to do a good job with reproducing that before you go into spatializing it. And so that, that hasn't really been something I've been too interested in getting too involved with, but it, it was fun. The one thing that we did do, it was, you know, that whole process of researching and, Hey, you know, the song, come listen to it. What's missing. And then you get a few feedbacks from some folks and then you kind of get there and then it's like, okay, now I get to get creative in Atmos, but that's, that's a process. The most of the the projects I'm working on are, you know, hey, can we have this by Friday? And we don't have a lot of money. And, you know, how fast can you turn this around? So, you know, it's more, I think, if I can help artists get their music in Atmos and get it out there, than spending two months on recreating something that right. maybe isn't. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the episodes with Justin Gray, he goes into that quite a bit about you know the pressure of taking a classic record that everybody knows yeah and doing that conversion and i wouldn't want that pressure no and 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 i think that that in itself to respect the people's work that did it in the past and you know especially records we love and and know so intimately like if you do that wrong that's the thing about the technology in Atmos, especially for the consumer, is most of the people that are listening to Atmos don't realize it. So, you know, you're buying an iPhone, Dolby Atmos is enabled, you're listening on Apple Music, the Dolby Atmos mixes are playing by default. So if you hear your favorite song from the 70s, 80s, 90s, whenever, and it sounds different, mm -hmm. and you're like, man, that doesn't sound any good, and you skip it, you're actually going to take away the enjoyment of that music for the fan. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is a scary thing, is, like, you have to do do it just as you... I think you need to do it as good or better mm -hmm. so that the experience is better for the listener. So when someone hears it, they're like, wow, that is amazing. What happened to that song? Rather than, like, well, that's weird. Why does that song sound weird? So there's a lot of that that I think Atmos has the potential to make music better. Is all of the music in Atmos better than stereo? No. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, it's, it's daunting because, you know, the fans have listened to this probably more than the people that originally recorded yeah. it. And they, they know every detail of it, some of them. So it's a challenge to preserve that. 
it's I find it always an interesting adventure when mixing anything is like especially in a band situation or musicians well, who listens to what like is it someone that's centered on I can't understand the vocals or hear the vocals or the acoustic guitar part or the shaker I don't like the sound of that kick drum or snare drum and so you know I had a guitar player in here listening to a mix that we had done and it was back catalog stuff and it's like acoustic guitar isn't loud enough and I was like that was the furthest thing from what I was paying attention to and so it was nice to kind of get that perspective but at the same time if it's an important song to a lot of people, there's all those little intricacies that you sort of have to make sure you catch. And so that, we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm way more interested in working with people that are putting out new music that we can put into a, you know, in the realm of Atmos that just, you know, makes it easier for people to have a more enjoyable experience listening to it. Right. So. For you, when you get the stems, I mean, I have some, some real, you know, beginner questions here about this. <laughs> Do you want them with any kind of processing that's been, been used on the track? Do you want reverb stems that, that were used on the in the mix? Yes. What, what automation that was so used? yeah? I mean, it it, it can be uh, as granular as the mix engineer would like. And I've gotten some songs that have you know eighty or ninety stereo stems, which this is like too much to deal with at that point but you know for the most part it's you know integral components like guitar bass drums lead instruments vocals background vocals it's a lot nicer to deal with a dry vocal and the effects that's a tricky thing to explain to people how to print a, a wet vocal stem and a dry vocal stem and have them come back to being the right level usually i'll get wet and dry or just wet and then dry and wet and it's that's been a tricky thing because that gives me more flexibility in placement and allowing for the translation on multiple platforms to be a little less smeary when the effects are baked in on a lead vocal we have a little bit less the imaging is less precise because there's some you know modulation or space added to that so what i usually tell people is i'm like make all of your stems pull them into a session and hit play if it sounds like your mix, we're in really good spot. So I like to have it through all of the bus processing. If they're using a limiter, I have to kind of tonally match the stereo master. So my process is usually taking those and getting them into my Atmos template or, you know, I usually start from scratch on a project and then build a template out from that. But my goal is to match the stereo master tone and curve as best I can. So as close as I can get the stems to stack up to that, and then I'll do a little bit of processing to kind of get it to that final mastered stage because I want the Atmos mix to sound like the stereo master, not like the stereo mix. So sometimes mastering engineers are, you know, they just turn it up. Sometimes they're heavy handed and the changes are very tonal and it's brighter and darker and things like that. So I have to kind of pivot and adjust for those as I'm putting the Atmos mix together. But I can effectively work from just about anything. When people take time to do it, do it effectively and give me things labeled properly and what they are. And, you know, that's usually makes my life the easiest. I can label things and drop them in. And uh, the one thing I've found that is a really tricky thing to get around is there's a lot of digital plugins that add analog noise. So virtual gain or V gain or, you know, the noise button on certain reverb plugins get left on and printed through 20 or 30 stems. And so that stacked up is a really painful experience. And so yeah. that's been one of the biggest like problems I've had with stems outside of that. It's been a pretty enjoyable experience. It's actually pretty cool to hear some of the sounds that people are making and having them, you know, isolated so you can kind of geek out on what people are doing. And that, that's always kind of cool to kind of like dissect other people's creative choices and things like that. And, you know, it, that's been a really cool thing, but for the most part, I try and make it as easy as possible and, and just adapt to what I get. So I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to make it too much more difficult for an artist to get something in Atmos. I want to make this an easy process so we can keep getting cool music put out. So, you know, you mentioned that you get these stereo stems. Is that your preferred way? If, if it's a mono track, do you want a, a stereo with the with the effects or anything else? Anyway? Yeah, and in, in in I would describe my process as you know spatialized stereo. 
you know, I'm taking a lot of things that have stereo placement and maintaining those too. So if someone has something panned, I'm keeping that panning in my Atmos, unless it's really weird. I've not really changed anyone's panning position. And so that's something that also in stereo is easier to make those choices. So if someone's done that creatively and done some placement, if I have a stereo stem, it's placed where it is. That also stacks up to the stereo mix and master. So I try not to change that too much. When I get mono things, I work effectively, I would say almost exclusively in stereo stems when I'm mixing in Atmos. I find they translate and utilize the technology of Dolby Atmos the most effective way. So that just works for me to drop in stereo stems to stereo objects. I can place them where I need them to, and that yields the results I'm looking for. And that's been a, a really fairly cohesive pro process for me to get where I want to go as quickly as possible. I think if I had too many options of placement, especially in the stereo field, that would change what I'm doing as far as the relationship to the stereo decision. So, you know, I've never had a need to create stems for somebody to mix because I always do my it's own a tedious, mixing. horrible process. But. Yeah, I can understand <laughs> that. But in its simplest form, would that just be essentially muting all the tracks except the one you want and just running a mix? Yeah. Then doing it on the next track? Yeah. And that, that effectively uh, is what you're going to do for as many times as you want to do it. There is a really cool thing that Andrew Sheps worked with the Soundflow people called Bounce Factory. And so you can automate your bounce process so you can set up your Pro Tools, especially if you are using any outboard gear, you have to bounce in real time. So um, that's a cool process to kind of alleviate the need to be back in the room every three minutes and 40 seconds and then hit the button again. So... But yeah, effectively, you know, you want the drums in a stem, you solo the drums or mute everything else and hit record on your, your two bus, uh, wherever you're printing to. And, you know, I normally make a playlist and just keep renaming the playlist and go through and then export them, check them so that I put them in a stereo session and hit play and then hit play on, you know, solo the mix, reference those two and hope that it's close and if something's like twice as loud i know that i've got it in two stems that's something that i find is usually uh it's like wow that's really loud background vocals or that guitar solo is twice as loud as it should be somebody missed the mute yeah and i, I just had that in a, in a in a record that background vocals were tucked in a couple other spots and it was a pretty easy fix i, I was able to you know, once we knew what the problem was, I can make an adjustment on level. And there was one time we had to just get one fresh stem, but it's a pretty malleable process. There's a lot of flexibility, I think, in getting back to where we need to be, but that process is, is tedious. And that's, that's, what's kind of daunting. I've had an artist recently that was like, Hey, I can't, I have, graded my computer, changed my software. I can't recall these mixes. They just won't open up. And so we, you know, had to pass on doing Atmos, but you know, Okay, you know, what you're telling me is actually less daunting than my imagination. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it depends on how big the production is. That's you know, right. Like well, see, my stuff is yeah. pretty simple. You know, if I use 20 tracks, that's a big number right. of tracks, and a lot of them are recorded stereo tracks. Yeah. Yeah, it's so that wouldn't be too bad for me to have to do that. Yeah, and it's mostly like if someone, like you know, if I'm running a mix through some of my favorite gear, uh, I want to impart that tone on the stems so that when they show up in Atmos, I have some of that character in there. And, you know, uh, it, compressors may not be reacting the same. Maybe there's not the same kind of saturation, but I feel like even just imparting the tone of something when stacked back up, it gets you close enough that we're, you know, within the tolerances of having something sound very similar. So, well, if, um, Somebody's doing their mix through, you know, like like me and a lot of other people through a VT5 and a VT7. Mm -hmm. Do you want that on the mix bus on every? Oh yeah, stem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that that I feel like is a thing where, you know, what it does collectively is amazing, but that like slight bit of extra or whatever we're getting from that really helps kind of maintain the integrity between the stems and the way they stack up to the stereo mix so yeah it's usually i try and convince everyone to run it through there and even if they have like a pseudo limiter at the end it kind of helps me get to that point of a mastered track too because 
that's sort of like that no man's land of like I'm dealing with a stereo master, but I have the stems from the mixer, and that like you know could be one to two percent difference. It could be fifteen percent different than the mix, right? So like adjusting accordingly for that sometimes is tricky just to kind of get that final that's what the finish sounds like these don't quite get there and then that's the sort of process that i end up doing which is sort of broad stroke stuff across all of the stems so yeah well i know that if i if i were going to have something mixed in atmos which i hope someday you'll be able to do something i think actually you do have a project in the works yeah there's a couple things we've been working with the hazel rig guys and um we've got a a classical piano thing we got the hazel rig synchronicity record got a uh a punk rock record. That, right, that's the one I recorded. Yeah, so that's that's in process. Um, and then I heard there's some bird recordings that I'm supposed yeah. to work on soon, which right. I'm kind of curious to see how that... Yeah, me too. You know, I recorded that in May of 2020 when everything was shut down and the world was quiet. I live out in the woods, and I just thought, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Yeah. So two days in a row, I got up at 4 a.m., I put my... Neumann SM69 outside and just hit record and let it run. The original's recorded in DSD, and it's phenomenal. When I, I'd be interested in your reaction. Yeah, when well, you, get you to know, hear after that. we finish this, we might have to pull it up and have a listen. But yeah, I and and I think that there's, I think that this is the platform for things like that. And I think it's an experience for people too. Like if we're, you know, getting away from talking about pop popular music in general, but like, you know, soundtracks, art installations, experiences, you know, being able to put on a set of headphones and like, listen to that. Like, you know, we're not talking about listening to an album's worth of material, but like, you know, if you're putting that on and like, I know there's a lot of avid bird watchers and stuff like that, mm-hmm, but like, that's an experience that you can have. And, and I don't think there's a lot of things that, from a sonic standpoint, can get that close to the reality of being there as Atmos can. Yeah, so. yeah. We did another project, which I don't know if anybody's told you about yet, but it's Singing Bowls. I uh, heard about it, but yeah. I don't know much. Yeah, and um, this really wonderful artist that I've worked with, she's part of another group, and I just thought this would be a great solo thing. You know, both that and the birds are kind of environmental sounds. Yeah. You know, not my usual kind of thing, but it's really interesting to do. And in the back of my mind as I'm recording this, I'm thinking, if this if what do, what do I have to do to give Sean stuff to play with here? Well, you know, and, 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 and I think that we've kind of proven that it's not even really necessary to have extra because like the unmasking that sort of happens when we take even a stereo element and get it into the space we can i mean you know sometimes cheat on some stuff but do some process where even stereo can be immersive right. way more immersive than stereo in itself so right. yeah. um you know and and you know maybe that's some psychoacoustic stuff but even just having the reproduction and the way that you perceive sounds from behind your head compared to how you perceive sounds in front of you mm-hmm. gives a lot of different uh, you know, you can fool fool people into thinking different things when they're listening to stuff, which is amazing. So yeah, well, in this case, I used a pair of Flea C12s in Bloomline as the main pickup, and then I had two 44s spaced out. Which okay, I, I thought you know would have some phase problems, but it actually doesn't. The stereo from the 44 still awesome. sounds pretty good. And then I put my SM69 up a way up as far up as I could go. And sort of in back of her. Okay. And she had about 20 bowls. Wow. So there's a really wide stereo. Yeah, yeah. Here. So you'll have fun with that, I hope. Yeah, no, I mean, that. yeah, I, I'm interested to hear. And that's something, too, like being able to pull something like that into this space and listen to it for the first time, too, is like there's a lot of times. Uh, I've given myself chills more, uh, mm-hmm. like, and and. I've told this story many times, but like mixing front of house when I was on tour with the Counting Crows, when we do big shows and there'd be a lot of people, I'd be in front of house and it's loud and there's lots of people and like that cheering and your body kind of tingles. Mm-hmm. Um, in the studio, you, I, yeah, you know, I could turn it up, yeah. I could turn it up real loud, but I would never get that. Yeah. This experience is like a full body experience, wow. and it is something that needs to be experienced. I mean, uh, I encourage anyone to listen to Atmos in an Atmos space if they can. But I get the the excitement and just 
listening on headphones also changes my perspective of stereo, but the full body experience in this room, the way that you can sort of just feel the music is pretty unmatched, um, as far as a controlled environment. So yeah, uh, I'm excited to hear your recordings and, and keep, keep, keep working together on stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And that's, I think having the opportunity to be creative in audio too, like there's a lot of, I don't know. I think we're both fans of the recording process. I'm always been, that's been my sort of go-to is like, I like to record, you know, humans playing music. That's sort of yeah. my favorite thing to do, but you know, the recording process it, itself, that part's exciting for me. The mixing, mm-hmm. that stuff has never been, never reproduced the, the energy that you can capture. And in, in Atmos, I think it kind of opens those doors to, to being able to make, that emotional and human connection happen more efficiently and and more often. So, well, I'm I'm convinced now. You know, after hearing things in this room, that that, that there's really something to it, and and I think once people get to the stage where they they start to really understand how to best use this new tool that we have, that I think it's going to be pretty spectacular, and it translates down to headphones. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is it doesn't not work in stereo. I mean, right. the binaural gives you, uh, if treated properly, gives you an excellent experience in stereo headphones. And so, um, yeah, it's a shape shifter, which is super cool. Sometimes you don't know what's going to happen, but you got to kind of trust the process and trust the technology to hopefully do what you expect it to, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Anything else that we didn't discuss that you think uh, would be important in this discussion? Um, well, we covered it all. That's a pretty good conversation there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just hope we get to keep doing stuff. Maybe we should talk again sometime after yeah, after right. the bird record. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I think that's the next thing. I, I think that is being released. Uh, the stereo is being released this month. Okay. It may even actually be out now. And uh, so we're looking forward to hearing what Atmos does, what you can do with it. Yeah, no, it sounds well, great. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Sean. This no, has been a great conversation. I learned a whole lot, so that's, that's really well, no, that's, valuable that's to me. That's impressive to hear from you, so I, I appreciate your time. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate your time. Thanks for making this great facility available for recording this today. Oh, uh, happy to have you. Yeah, thanks. As always, thank you for listening, and if anybody has any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, email me at dwfern at dwfern.com. I'm Doug Fern. This is my take on music recording. See you next time.